Have you ever wanted one of those cool old bronze signs you see at like historic landmarks or in like old buildings? Or maybe you've seen the prices that those things go for on Etsy and you thought, hey, I bet I could make one of those. Well, I want one for this garage uh, and I'm gonna show you how I make one. Hopefully, I'll show you how to make one with fewer screw ups. Learn from my mistakes. To start with, you're gonna need to design a sign. Signs are usually, uh, you know, rectangles with like raised borders and raised text. Here's what I made. I designed this up in Fusion 360, but pretty much any 3D modeling software can do everything you need here. I had some trouble getting the uh, text, the text to extrude with draft. Weird, because I've done it before in Fusion, never had a problem. I, uh, I chamfered the edges a bit to try to imitate it, which kind of works, but it's not, not really, not really that good. Uh, you, want, you want draft on everything. Aim for like five degrees. You know, more if you can get away with it, if it doesn't look goofy. The sides and everything of this part are, are made with draft. I'm not gonna walk you through how to do step-by-step -step how to design a sign in Fusion or whatever program. They're all different and they're all constantly changing. But you can learn how to do all of this stuff in like just a basic Fusion like tutorial on YouTube. I know this because that's all the training I have and I managed to pull it off. This one is, let me see, about eight inches by about three inches and it's about a quarter inch thick. That might be a bit too thick. Uh, I'm not sure how heavy these things are supposed to be, but I, I could bludgeon someone with one of these one of these signs pretty easily. Thinner, thinner parts are harder to cast properly. The metal tends to freeze, so keep that in mind. I printed this in a uh, garish yellow PLA because I think that's what was in the printer at the time. But my, my fantastic attention to detail aside, it's, it's very simple. It's not difficult to do but you will need to sand it. Even on fine settings, the little 3D print layer lines, they tend to grip the sand. The sand's very fine also, so think of it like teeth locking in together. It's gonna be difficult to sand the sides of the letters. That's why you really do need draft on those. Uh, and also the top. So you wanna hit that with sandpaper to sand that down. Sandpaper, by the way, clogs very quickly with plastic. I would suggest these. Uh, these see-through ones, these are designed to not clog up with wood dust or wood finish. Uh, they also don't clog up with plastic or with spray paint. Keep that in mind. I don't know how, how long they last, like as far as sharpness relative to other sandpaper, but they don't clog. I'll put links to this stuff uh, in the comments below. It's great. I use it for, I, I use it for wood stuff too. I don't even, I don't like the normal stuff. If you have any issues with the prints, like holes and the stop start line or whatever, I would suggest this plastic wood filler. Uh, DAP plastic wood. I'll put links to this down below too. You can get it at hardware stores. You can get it everywhere. Uh, it sticks really well to the, to the plastic. If you're old school and you made your pattern from wood, I wouldn't suggest wood filler. I would say use water putty. The water putty doesn't stick to the 3D prints, but the wood filler does. Go figure. Then you know sand it smooth. You know how wood filler works. Now when ramming this up in the sand, I put the text face down, or as you see in the video, face up in the bottom flask, the drag. And since this is a really long sign, I added multiple paths for the metal to enter. This helps the metal make it all the way to the corners. If it comes in here, it has a long way to go to get to the edges and it can freeze on the way. Trust me, I've made this mistake before. Another mistake I've made before are these tall feeder vent things. I'm not gonna do it that way anymore and I'll show you why when I get the casting out of the sand. So I'm pouring this with bronze, ancient bronze, the kind with tin in it, about 10% about tin, about 90% copper. I say about because I mix this stuff up and I'm not super careful with the measurements or the math, but tin bronze is very forgiving, so go with it. Now, if you're gonna do this, I would recommend buying some ancient bronze casting grain or ingots from a reputable source like Belmont Metals or Rio Grande or somewhere like that so you know you get like good metal that's not gonna hate you. You know, scrap is like good and all, but you're just opening yourself up for problems, contaminated metal, all that kind of stuff. But if you're gonna use it anyway, I would recommend looking into what's something called phosphor copper shot. It's like a deoxidizer and a flux. It's very cool. But if you're buying like the casting grain, you could probably get away without it. Uh, it is really cool though. Now, some of you might be wondering, why am I not using that electric oven that I spoke so highly of earlier? Well, this isn't the only bronze sign I've made recently, nor is it the biggest. The last one I made was for a friend of mine. You can see here, it's considerably larger. You know, it's not quite as long, but it's much taller. It used a lot more metal. It was to celebrate his wedding and uh, he liked it. So there, there's another idea. Give these to people as gifts. I used the electric furnace and the three kilogram crucible for that. Uh, I filled it right to the top. That was more than enough metal for that big sign and a few ingots. And that thing was surprisingly heavy. 
I'm not sure it matters that the corners are rounded off. You know, if he drops the thing, he's going to break his toe. Like, that's guaranteed to happen. So if you are using that electric furnace, here are some tips, all right? It's going to take a long time. If you're going to fill that thing up to the tippy top with bronze, that's a lot of bronze and a lot of temperature, especially because you're going to want to ignore everything you read about pouring temperatures. The pouring temperatures you read about, about 100 degrees above melting, that's mostly for investment casting, which, which uses heated molds, right? This sand stuff isn't heated, and these patterns are very large but thin, so they have a large surface area. And you don't want the metal cooling off in there. So just crank the temperature right to the top, 1150 Celsius, or whatever that is in real degrees. Now the manual says, after you've used it for two hours, turn it off, let it rest for a while, right? Obviously. But if you don't, and you just leave it on maximum temperature, melting a whole bunch of nasty scrap copper down, around hour three, there's gonna be a heat safety that trips and turns the thing off. So if you blow a fan, just kind of gently into the side where those opening vents are, it won't trip anymore. Don't do that. Follow the instructions, don't do that. But if you do that uh, around hour four or five of your two hour session, the GFI outlet it's plugged into is gonna get so hot, it's gonna start tripping off on its own. And you're gonna have to plug the very warm extension cord in somewhere else. Definitely don't do that. But if you do, right around hour six, ish of the two hour session, uh, you're gonna see that the crucible looks pretty gross and you're gonna get really nervous and you're gonna finish up what you're doing and turn it off. Yeah, that crucible still works. I mean, it still holds, but it doesn't look very good and it makes me kind of nervous. So that's why I'm using the propane one this time. I'll get a new crucible. I'll, I'll get one, don't worry about it. And final tip, if you are gonna abuse a machine like this, make sure it's a very simple program machine, not something with AI or like a machine spirit or whatever, unless you want Skynet to come for you first. Back to the casting. So right out of the sand, I see one big problem. Generally it looks pretty good, but look at this G. Right above that is one of those big feeder vent things. And on first inspection, I suspect some careless idiot blew some sand down that hole, it got lodged in the G, and ruined my sign. I'm not, it's not a big deal, I'm not bitter, maybe a little bit, but I might be wrong on that. I'll show you why later. So after cleaning this up, I think I have a plan. How do you hide glaring errors? Camouflage. Bronze can take on so many cool patinas and colors uh, that I think I can distract people away from this. Uh, but th this isn't a new idea. A lot of those signs have painted lower sections and then the upper sections are polished. You get a nice contrast between the two. Really makes the letters pop. But I'd rather give that patina thing a try. I'll just skim over the whole process for now because I am very much just dipping my toes into a huge thing that definitely needs a lot more experimentation and research. Suffice it to say, I needed full strength ammonia and white vinegar and salt to get it to do anything in a reasonable amount of time. The kind where you definitely need gloves and to be outside and it's still terrible. Wow, that stuff smells awful. I can't believe anyone cleans with that inside a house. So I wanted the blue, like the blue color that a lot of the ammonia recipes can get and it went blue very quickly and then very green. I don't know why. Uh, I must have screwed something up. I, if you want a specific color, I guess use paint. But it still ended up looking pretty cool, especially the raised sections once they get polished. I just hit it with that sandpaper, like they did 200 grit, 400 grit, 600, 1200, and 2000 just with like a block hand sanding away. And it looks pretty good. The G still looks kind of screwed up. So is it sand? Well, maybe. You know, the texture of the, the divot looks kind of like a sand texture, not a jaggedy texture like you would expect from a shrinkage hole. But then there's those feeders. The one that's not above a problem has a sunken in top, which means the metal fed into something, right? It did its job. The one above the G, uh, the top didn't sink in. So I don't think it fed anything. And the base of it, where that feeder meets the bottom, it actually is sunken in a bit, almost like it's pinching off, which tells me there was some shrinkage right there. Something that's uniformly thin probably doesn't even need a feeder. Like, just forget it. Vent the sand. Just vent the sand, you're good. Although the feeders do make it really easy to prop it up on a table. That's pretty cool, right? I am gonna have to cut those off later. I think I might try for the blue color first, though. What do you think? 